This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up, Rob Stewart, president of Lime Instruments, this incredible company changing the way critical activities are measured at the well site. Next up, David Kaiserman, president of Lennar Ventures, a home builder talking about their new program to standardize solar on all their new homes. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, this is Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. We have with us today Rob Stewart, president of Lime Instruments. Rob, great to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. So tell us about Lime. Lime Instruments is a, uh, a company that specializes in controls and instrumentation systems for uh, industrial equipment. We've been very successful in the hydraulic fracturing market and providing controls, instrumentation, and data acquisition systems for the uh, hydraulic fracturing, pressure pumping market, as well as cool tubing and cementing. So during all this fracking boom, you're, you're, you're the guy in charge of some of the instrumentation behind it. That's correct. Our goal is to take the entire spread of equipment that's on location during these jobs and bring all the control, all the data ag aggregation together into one central environment and give them the ability to remotely transmit that data as well as tie in remotely from outside places to control, uh, help and improve the production and, uh, of these assets. The neat thing about the shale activity is that the horsepower intensity is so much higher. There's so many more pieces of equipment coming on those locations and they need to keep people out of the danger zones. They need to be able to centralize the control with fewer people because they now they're bringing 20 to 30 pumps that sometimes on these locations and used to be you'd have to have one operator for each one of those pieces of equipment. Sure. With the systems like what we're providing, they can now have one guy that can control all those pieces of equipment as well as keeping those people out of the danger area. So, so tell me about uh, the, the products. What do they look the like? The products are essentially in uh, weather controlled boxes and enclosures that we put all the instruments in, the, the wires, the power supplies, the controllers, the displays. We put them locally on the units as well as inside the cabins, the data vans, where all the data comes back. Well, and how is your product different than the competition? The idea of what we came to market with is the fact that we're a universal remote control. At your home, you have a Sony television, you have a Pioneer receiver, you have a Sony DVD player, and you have all these different brands sure. of products, and you have one remote that can control them. That's the same application that we're trying to bring to the pressure pumping market. You've got several different manufacturers that produce this equipment. They have different ways of doing things between those equipment, and our goal is to take all of it, no matter who built it, and make it all look the same to the operator. That way they're standardized with one package, they're supporting, keeping inventory and training on that one system as opposed to multiple systems from multiple vendors. So do you sell primarily here in the U.S.? We've been really uh, fortunate in the United States to have most of the shale boom activity happening here domestically. There is some activity happening up in Canada. Down, It's starting to go more globally. And we've had systems that we've delivered into China, into the Middle East, as well as uh, South America and, and Canada. But the, the main volume is coming from the domestic United States. I know training is a big part of, uh, of, of what you do, and in fact, uh, I, I hear you, you built a, a big training facility. Tell, tell us about that. That's correct. With the advent of this, this type of technology, there's a lot of different types of training that's required for the people that are out there running the equipment, and that's one of the you know, gaps in this market and this technology is the people aren't really proficient with the computer networks, uh, software programming and configuration 
So we've been doing a lot of training of those people and the personnel that are out there running the equipment, which is why we had to put together that training center. You come in there, they want all these bells and whistles, but with those bells and whistles come some complexity and some like inner working that you have to teach these people how to use. And you bought this company when? In September 2006, we acquired uh, Supreme Electrical Services Incorporated. How many employees? It was about 18 at the time of employment, and uh, today? at the time of purchase, excuse me. And today we're a, a little bit over uh, 80 people incredible growth it's been it's been dramatic it's been fun but it's uh giving me some of the gray hair that you, you enjoy looking at <laughs> well it, it sounds like you were really in the right place at the right time and we, we've seen a, a lot of supply of natural gas from from the fracking Definitely. and and there's talk that maybe that supply and and waiting for demand to catch up will will cause the market to dip how, how do you prepare for that well, that's where the diversification comes in. And certainly as the market starts to dip, and it has because commodity prices have obviously gone down, so the demand for new equipment is dwindled. New equipment's just one aspect of what we do. One of the other aspects is, is the retrofitting of existing equipment, sure. taking existing resources and improving them, uh, making them more efficient for personnel. You don't require as many personnel to operate our equipment, but we're also trying to diversify into some other uh, industries outside of just oil and gas. So what's next? What we're trying to do now is take this same type of technology and apply it outside of the oil and gas uh, arena. The oil and gas is great. I think if you can prove your product, oil field tough, sure. I think everything else uh, should be quite a bit easier to prove because we package for the most extreme rugged conditions that are typically the enemy of electronics. So we, we focus on rugged ability, G-Shock ratings, temperature specs from minus 40 to plus 50 to 70 C. I mean, these just horrid extremes that are mo on mobile equipment going all over the, the earth and, sure. and some of the worst environments. So changing that technology and putting it into other environments like the electric utilities, uh, power monitoring, uh, the smart grid initiative, things of that nature, are great uh, opportunities for this type of technology that should be a lot easier for us to be packaging for. Have you started any of that diversification? We have. We've been working on the smart grid initiative with uh, Centerpoint. We've been doing some pilot programs with them right. on monitoring a neighborhood and how some of this distributed generation activity impacts the network and how the utilization of power is through the instruments that we provide. We're providing them data that they have not seen. And uh, so that's something that we're excited about. But like any industry, it takes time to build up, you know, the, the reputation, the comfort levels. And so that's why we're doing the pilots and slowly working our way into those markets. Now, Rob, you've been in this business a long time. Can you share with our viewers some, some of your history? Well, I'm, I'm proud to be a fifth generation steward of the Stuart and Stevenson legacy. Started back in 1902. It was a great history. Hit distribution businesses, manufacturing businesses, military trucks, generators, and all these great things. It was an honor to be a part of that. I was uh, you know, sad to see the company sell in 2005 to another investor and uh, at 2006 is when I exited the business and went back into a family-based business. Well, and it sounds like you're taking a lot of that operating history and applying it for, for some exponential growth. That's the idea. That's, so that's what you got to do in this business. Well, thanks for coming in and visiting with us. Thank you, sir. And that concludes our discussion with Rob Stewart. We'll be back with more right after this. The future is here. You can't see it. It's At NRG, we're providing clean energy and now charging stations to make the electric car a reality. Kind of makes you want to boogie woogie, doesn't it? NRG, moving clean energy forward. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Makers Show. My guest now, David Kaiserman, president of Lenar Ventures. David, welcome Paul, to the program. Nice to see you again. So tell our viewers about Lenar. Well, Lenar is one of the nation's largest publicly held home builders and has been building homes since 1954. Long time. Long time, over 800,000 homes, and today just about 19 different states. Primarily in the Sun Belt and on the eastern, in the east coast, but we have some pockets here and there. 
Well, the Sun Belt uh, uh, brings us to what we would love to talk with you about today, which is solar and sure. Lennar. Uh, t tell us a little bit about uh, what you're working on. So Lennar has been involved in solar since 2006 when we included it as part of our homes in Northern California. And we've had a great experience. Um, unlike days of past where people have raised concerns about the aesthetics of solar or sure. whether it actually functions as promised, um, our experience has been that people generally embrace solar as a new technology being part of the state-of-the-art home. And so including it as part of the Lennar home is just a natural extension for us and it's been very well received. So for your consumers, if you want solar, if you don't want solar, how, how does that decision uh, sure. work? So there's really two different flavors of solar out there. The one um, that Lennar generally uh, promotes is one of the standard feature and everything's included feature. And those are homes that include solar on them. They're not things that you can opt in or opt out of, but they're standard included on the home. Um, other builders out there offer uh, options, solar options, um, upgrade options, and that too is sort of in the marketplace today. How did Lennar decide to go all in? So Lennar, generally speaking, has adopted a platform of everything's included in its business generally. So when you look to buy a Lennar home, the amount of options and upgrades that you actually receive are far fewer than some other option type builders out in the marketplace today. So including solar was a very natural fit for us with our everything's included platform. All right, so I bought my Lennar home, solars powered up on the roof. How, how much electricity am I generating? You know, it varies market to market, and unfortunately sometimes is a function of regulation more than it is the roof size that's available. Uh, in some markets, utilities want to make sure that the homeowner is not overproducing or a net producer. Right. So the amount of energy the system produces is sized to the expected energy consumption of the home. In other places like Texas where there are high air conditioning loads and electricity is used much more than in some of the cooler climate zones, um, you can expect solar at 50%, some other places like California up to 85%. Are there certain states that you're targeting? So we have uh, historically had solar involved in our California markets and recently have rolled that out to Texas uh, where we started a limited experiment as well and uh, to promising results. And as some consumers, of course, are worried about cost. How, how do you as the builder work through that? In a couple of different ways. Obviously, people who want to own and enjoy solar can clearly do so as part of the purchase of their home. But we've recently rolled out in California the availability of a solar lease, which makes the upfront cost nearly zero for the consumer and allows them to buy the energy produced by that system over time at a discount to retail prices. So we've got two flavors. Um, people have been really receptive to both. Well, I know from my government days, we were always trying to figure out how, how do we deploy more solar? How, how do we get people to step up and having, uh, you know, such a, 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 an icon in the home building space uh, take a leadership uh, role here is, is to me unique and, and important to highlight. Yeah, I mean, I think um, home builders in general have a really strong value to offer consumers in today's market, and that's the benefit of a new home, a home that's built to new energy codes, one that uses less energy than the existing housing stock, and one that really can take solar and realize its true benefits much simpler than it would be on a retrofit basis. And so it's not just Lennar that's pursuing these initiatives. Uh, most of our uh, peer builders in the marketplace have begun to adopt various stages of energy efficiency, the inclusion of solar, some have even gone to electric vehicle charging stations as well. So I think you'll see that advancement in technology continue uh, as the new home building market tries to distinguish its product against uh, the resale homes in the market today. Some of our solar uh, friends have, have talked about net metering and how that fits into the decision or not. Can you tell us how that affects you? Yeah, um, it affects us uh, very much. Net metering is a complicated concept of state law generally that most consumers don't really understand. And part of our challenge is in explaining to them very simplistically that there is a state law in effect that permits you to take energy produced by your solar system and sell it back to the grid or have your meter run backwards. Um, and that's very important to the consumer because the energy that they're producing when they're away at work, um, if they have to pay for that, obviously it's lost. 
but having a um, net metering system in place, as opposed to a battery backup or anything right. of the sort, provides customers with a financial backstop, right, to ensure that they're not overpaying for the benefits of solar energy. Well, David, thank you for coming in today. Congratulations on all the success. Thank you for having me. And that wraps this episode of the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson. We'll see you next week.